all the four evangelists makes this a very horrifying experience. And I was tempted at some point that even though Jesus is the central figure, it would be interesting to look, and this is a story familiar to all of us, it would be interesting to see how Matthew has developed all of the side characters as a contributor to pointing to what this story is really all about. And I was tempted, but I decided not to do that today. This story has many emotions and ambiguities that are expressed within them. So I want to begin with this prayer as we sort of look at this story. Let us pray. Holy God, Open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits to you and one another. Let us together consider your words and your thoughts and their meaning for us. Let us not be afraid to hear your truths. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to us. Amen. Amen. Palm Sunday signals the beginning of the end for Jesus of Nazareth. It is also the climax of the Christian story. Christ enters the gates of Jerusalem to songs of praise, only to hear those same voices turn first to accusations and then to jeers as he goes to his death on the cross. This day begins with a festive procession, excited children and adults waving palm branches gave way to violent mobs shouting death threats. Adoration by the crowds in Jerusalem evaporate, evaporated rather, onto abandonment by God on Golgotha. Between Palm Sunday and Good Friday, Jesus' disciples argued among themselves about who was the greatest. Judas betrayed him and then committed suicide. Peter denied ever knowing him, and all his disciples fled from the high grass, interestingly enough, except for the women. After three years of itinerant preaching, teaching, and healing that focused on the poor, the imprisoned, the blind, and all who were oppressed. Jesus' family declares him insane, the religious establishment hated him, and the political authorities had had enough. And so Rome deployed all the brutal means at its disposal to crush an insurgent movement, which our presiding bishop calls the Jesus movement, by rendition, interrogation, torture, mockery, humiliation, and then a sadistic execution designed as a calculated social deterrent to any other troublemakers who might challenge imperial authority and disturb the Pax Dramatis. This is what we've just read in Matthew 11 to 57. If you remove the sentimental piety that has developed over the centuries that we've attached to the story, let us look at it again. And we have to ask some other questions. Why did Jesus die? The Passion Narratives for Holy Week, which we've heard today, we will hear on Thursday and on Good Friday, uh, tells us and explains why Jesus died. Luke says that they executed Jesus for three reasons. Quote, we found this fellow subverting the nation, opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ the king. That's from Luke. In John's gospel, the angry mob warns Pilate, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. That's John 19. In short, they continue, he is subverting our nation. He opposes Caesar. You can't befriend both Jesus and Caesar, end of quote. And you know what? They were right. More right than they knew or could have imagined. Jesus' triumphant entry, I propose, into the streets of Jerusalem was a dramatic parable, deeply ironic, highly symbolic, and a deliberately provocative act. 
it was an enacted parable. Did Jesus teach all through his last three years in parables that dramatize his subversive mission and message? The parables address the lives of his during his time and his solutions and understandings always turn the status quo and its supporters upside down and around, which is why they were so furious with him for the last three years. The parables always spoke to alternative ways of seeing being and therefore behaving in our current reality. This entry of Jesus into Jerusalem was Jesus's last will and testament about who he was and what his kingdom was all about. The context, however, which makes it even more interesting, was that this story took place around the celebration of the Passover. And there's two things to remember about this, that the Roman authorities always made a show of force during the Jewish Passover when pilgrims from all over Palestine and the Jewish diaspora made their way to Jerusalem to, to celebrate their political liberation from Egypt centuries earlier. New Testament scholars such as Marcus Borg and Dominic Crossan have said that there were two processions into Jerusalem that day. The first was Jesus who entered Jerusalem from the east in fulfillment of the prophet Zechariah's pro prophecy, which said, look, your king is coming to you gently and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. That was in this morning's Matthew 5, and that's from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9. And the second procession was from the West, which was the Roman governor Pontius Pilate into Jerusalem with all the pomp of state power. Pilate's brigade showcased Rome's mighty might, power, and glory. Jesus' triumphant injury, by, however, by stark contrast, was an anti-imperial and anti-triumphal counter-procession of peasants that proclaimed an alternative and different community that for the past three years, Jesus had called the kingdom of God. Although Palm Sunday marked the beginning of the end for Jesus of Nazareth, his end showed the way for our own beginning. So I ask again, how do we explain the crowd and their attitude? Several questions came to my mind and they are, why after all, do they herald his entrance, but then participate in his violent departure? Were they in the end disappointed in Jesus's teachings? What motivated those crowds? What motivates us as we've listened to this story year after year? And I ask, what do we today seek in Jesus? What do we believe he has come to accomplish? Because that's underneath is what Matthew was getting at. Why do we pledge our allegiance to Jesus on Sunday and yet all too often turn our attention elsewhere for the rest of the week? These are the desert questions that I have been implying for the last four weeks that I've preached to you through all of these stories and, and narratives. This is the desert. These are the desert questions. That, are, that emerge. And this story brings them to a climax. And finally, what does this mean for us today in light of our current reality of this pandemic and other things in our world? It might mean that it is time and we have an opportunity to evaluate what really matters to us. Isn't that the purpose of the desert experience? Isn't that the purpose of Nicodemus asking Jesus how one can be reborn again? And then how do we create an attitude in the light of our current reality to face an unknown future? And so we ask in trying to develop an attitude of change, what are our core values of conscience, which are greater than possessions and titles and personas? The triumphal entry into Jerusalem is a time to take stock of everything 
and determine what are non-essentials and what are essentials to body and spirit. And if we've talked in our discussions for the last seven weeks, five weeks rather, these are the same kinds of questions, the same kinds of realities that we are experiencing in our world as we participate in social distancing and all the other practices and the ways in which we've attempted to keep in touch with each other, to communicate, to reestablish intimacy, to continue intimacy. These are the questions. And it's the same questions, and it is our movement into Jerusalem. And this movement into Jerusalem signals a movement of leaving one kind of time for another. We are leaving Kronos time, and we're entering into Kairos time. A good friend of mine, Brother Don Passan, who is a marriage brother and a well-known union spiritual director, puts this journey this way, and it actually describes what we're going through in our times at this moment. And he says, the ordinary repetitive time of daily life has been transposed into a liminal space for transformation. We cannot put this movement away, no matter who tries to do it. This is God's time to see reality on a different level of intensity and awareness. We are asked to let go of everything, weddings, funerals, celebrating holidays and holy days. This includes this Easter and this Palm Sunday. This has not been before and may or may not happen again. This shock wakes us up from our slumber of religion as usual. There's more prayer going on, wrestling with God images and our understanding of life around us. We are all living something together, a common experience of life. We must wait. We are not fully in control, and though we don't like it, this lack of control happens all the time, even though we think we're in control. Religion and its pietistic responses cannot survive this testing period of deep transformation. It is the experience of God now which must come forward stripped of any kind of security. And that ends his quote. Perhaps then, finally, we can begin to see how the light overshadows the darkness. We can now see the light that has been beckoning us through this journey in the desert that we've experienced this last six weeks. It has been our journey with Christ on his way to Jerusalem. And today we meet with Jesus in Jerusalem. And as we meet him in, in Jerusalem, we realize that this trip to Jerusalem, this entrance into Jerusalem, is a road to transformation. And that transformation becomes clear to us. My question to all of you is, will you take it? Will you breathe as we prayed last week in God's breath? I ask you, amen.